It's the unofficial start of summer, and we hope you're having a great Memorial Day weekend. I'm Charlie Sykes. Sunday Insight starts right now. Good morning and welcome to Sunday Insight. In the week that was, an inspector general report says that Hillary Clinton broke government rules with the use of a private secret email system. Donald Trump clinches the delegates that he needs for the Republican nomination. The secretary of the VA compares veteran wait times to waiting in line for rides at Disneyland. Wisconsin joins other states in suing the Obama administration over its new transgender bathroom mandate. A state appeals court reinstates the right to work law. A new poll shows Speaker Paul Ryan leading his Sarah Palin backed and, uh, challenger by 73 percentage points, 80 to 7. And no, that is not a typo. And the new Buck Stadium gets the green light from the Milwaukee Common Council. But we start with the complicated bromance between the Republicans, the Republican Party's presumptive nominee, Donald Trump, and the Republican Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan. On Wednesday, a story leaked, leaked by the Trump campaign suggested that a Ryan endorsement was imminent. Uh, no, it's not, Ryan's staff said. The men spoke by phone that night, a conversation that Ryan described as productive, but still no endorsement. Joining me on our panel this morning, the Milwaukee Community Journal's Michael Holt, former state representative Michelle Litchens, defense attorney Dan Adams, and Colin Roth, a research fellow at the Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty. Welcome back, Colin. Okay, so what is going on with Trump and Ryan? Well, I think they're trying to find some common ground on what, you know, between their different agendas and their different views of uh, what it means to be a Republican and different visions for the country. But it's increasingly difficult. We know that Paul Ryan is someone who believes in free trade, has fought for things like the uh, TPA and the TPP uh, very forcefully. He believes in comprehensive immigration reform. He's been an advocate for those types of things. Um, and but he's going to get around to supporting him sooner I, I think so he what, is. So what's the point of the kabuki dance? Well, and, and again, I think trying to find some common ground on, on some things that they can both say in good conscience and agree on. But I think Ryan is going to have to reserve some space to disagree with Donald Trump, the nominee. What was the point of that leak? Was, uh, were the Trump folks trying to pressure? Were they trying to oh, absolutely. bully Ryan Yeah, I think we've seen something? this before. We've seen made-up phone calls and made-up leaks before. But it, it is interesting. The longer this plays out, it'll be damaging. Dan Adams. Well, politicians all have one goal, yeah. and that's to maximize their power. Yeah. And Paul Ryan has a lot of power. I mean, yeah. he's third in line for the presidency. His only job is to preserve that power. Yeah. And it's interesting because he's risen to power by being a pretty principled guy. Yeah. I don't agree with everything, but he's been principled on his conservative you know, uh, talking points for a long time. And at this point, he needs to decide whether he's going to sacrifice for the long term these principles for short term power, although that's a lot of power in the short term. Okay, so what should he do and what will he do, Michelle Legend? He will ultimately endorse yeah. Donald Trump for president. I don't think there's any, any real question about that. But when it comes to power, Paul Ryan's real job is to bring back a majority in Congress. And right now they're putting together a plan yeah. for how to do that. And so I think Donald Trump is ultimately going to have to kind of agree with him on that plan. Hey, Michael Holt. Yeah, I don't know what he's, he's holding out for. You know, he's not going to really get any concessions. You know, and I think uh, I heard one well. press conference where he was talking about he doesn't want artificial unity, he wants real unity yeah. within the Republican Party. What does that mean? You will ultimately endorse Donald Trump, but that doesn't mean that there's unity within the Republican uh, Party. I, I, well, I'm it's never going to happen. I, I'm never going to do it, and I actually, I actually think it's a little bit more complicated. I, 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 Paul Ryan has to thread the needle. This is a this is a really difficult situation for him. He's got to find a way to ultimately support the nominee of the party without basically debasing himself, you know, a la Chris Christie. And he's got to figure out a way to do it. And what's hard about this, of course, is with, with Donald Trump, usually the alternatives are either, you know, complete capitulation or defiance. There's no room for uh, any sort of civil disagreement. And I, I thought it was, it was interesting that Donald Trump made it, you know, I think more difficult for Paul Ryan to come around this week. Mm -hmm. Number one, by, by leaking that false story, which was perceived as bullying, and then, and then lashing out at New Mexico Governor Susana Martinez. I mean, here is a conservative Latina governor. Uh, she's the chairman of the Republican Governors Association. And what? She doesn't show up at a rally, so like a petulant 12-year-old, thin-skinned Donald Trump feels the need to lash out. And this comes a week after he had been assuring Republicans, you know, I will make the pivot. I am going to act more presidential. I'm not going to behave the same way. And then 
basically saying, no, you know, I'm still Donald Trump. Well, let me ask you a question, Charlie. Yeah. Do you think that Paul Nyland being uh, running for Paul Ryan's seat yeah. gives Trump some leverage over Paul Ryan to no. say, come home, no, no, I'm going to support this guy? No, not at all, because, I mean, you know, with a 73-point uh, edge, but the leverage, of course, is over the House majority and what's going to happen. And I think that I think that in terms of, of the leverage, what's going to happen is that Paul Ryan and the others are going to they're going to roll out their Republican House agenda, that 2017 agenda. If Trump endorses that and embraces mm -hmm. that, then they're on the same mm -hmm. page. I think there'll be an endorsement. If Trump does not embrace that or he basically doesn't support it, then I don't know. I think all bets are off. So what is your glass half full? What is your glass half empty? Let's go on the table. <coughs> Michael Holt, you are first. Well, my glasses have full because Alderman Russell Stamper has introduced an ordinance that would strengthen the residential preference program, open the door for jobs for black unemployed. My job is, my glasses have empty because there are some aldermen who embrace the status quo and a city attorney who opposes anything that remotely sounds like affirmative action. Michelle Litchens. My glass is half empty because Illinois is heading into bankruptcy. It is half full because conservative gov Governor Runner is fighting the public employee unions and the Democratic political machine with everything he has to save the state. Dan Adams. My glass is half full because the governor has signaled he may continue the UW tuition freeze in the next state budget. My glass is half empty because Democratic leaders Peter Barca and Jennifer Schilling still haven't found their footing on the issue. Friends, high tuition is a regressive fee on young people. We're against that, right? No. College affordability is our thing. Come on, make this a bipartisan issue. Colin Ross. Well, my glass is half full because new polling found 54% of Wisconsinites support school choice and its support is even higher in Milwaukee. It's half empty because it is still near impossible to find an elected Democrat in the state who support, supports parental choice. Yeah. My glass is half full because right to work is still the law of the land here. It's half empty because, once again, it took an appeals court to overturn an activist Dane County judge to restore a law passed by the legislature. Our Sunday Insight Countdown shows the last big primaries in California and five other states just nine days away. The Republican National Convention begins in 50 days. The Democratic National Convention is 57 days away. And Election Day, Tuesday, November 8th is 163 days from today. We'll be right back. The Veterans Administration is still crawling out from the scandal over how long veterans were forced to wait for medical care. Some veterans waited so long that they died. Last Monday, Bob McDonald, the secretary of the VA, gave an interview in which he compared the time that veterans wait to see a doctor to the time people spend in line for rides at Disneyland. He said, when you go to Disney, do they measure the number of hours you wait in line or what's important? What's important is what your satisfaction with the experience is. Well, reaction was swift and harsh. With Speaker Paul Ryan calling McDonald's comments disgusting and beyond the pale, your reaction, Michelle Hitchens. It is disgusting yeah. that he had the audacity yeah. to make that comparison. And I think this shows exactly what happens when a group of bureaucrats sitting around in a room, you know, talk about solving a problem hypothetically. You don't seek medical care until you need medical care. So talking about people waiting in line and seeing how they yeah. feel about waiting in line is well, really Well, you've ridiculous. spent some time at the VA recently. I've been uh, a lot of time. Yeah. I, mean, I yeah. still utilize yeah. the VA versus private insurance. Mm -hmm. Because in Milwaukee, it is without a doubt the best care yeah. in the country. Right. And I've never waited in a line. You know, I get sometimes tired because they overwhelm you with appointments to so check what was Bob, So what was Bob McDonald's His was inappropriate. Yeah. His was inappropriate. I, I, you know, it was kind of like Ed Flynn's comment a couple of weeks ago where he might have been trying to be facetious or funny and it, and it didn't work. You know, I understood what he was saying. He was talking about the care versus the weight, but he shouldn't have said it. Dan Adams. I'm interested in what the conservatives have to say about this government-run health care entity and whether the well, solution, lot, whether, to, whether the solution yeah. to this is to throw more money at a government-run health care institution. You, you, you actually ought to spend some time listening to conservatives like Colin Roth. What do conservatives <laughs> have to say about well, I think this is, a, this is a great avenue in, in yeah. which we, where you see a one-size-fits-all model is not you know, in tune with the, the needs and the, the different needs of veterans and, and for health care. And when you have a one-size-fits-all, you're going to be told to wait in line to and, and that is your option if that's your only option. And but I that's not your only option with the VA. Yeah. They created a program several years ago where veterans who utilize the VA could use a private right. physician. Which is a good idea. But it hasn't gone over right. well right. for some strange reason. 
maybe is a lack of uh, well this this issue this issue positions is, or whatever this, this issue has has obviously some local implications because the Toma VA scandal is not going away. In fact, there were reports this last week that perhaps another local politician, uh, Congressman Ron Kind, had been informed um, about some of the problems. One of the Marines who had died had been reaching out and trying to get somebody's attention and this story is gonna I don't I don't see this going away. Oh and the political yeah, implications yeah, no. obviously with, between Ron Kind and, and Senator former Senator Russ Feingold who's running for re-election we've seen this elevated into the uh, the political campaign and it is you know it, it's the confluence of the VA scandal as well as the op opioid crisis here in America and in Wisconsin has a lot of ugly factors to it. Yeah I, I, I keep trying to kind of reverse engineer what was going on inside Bob McDonald's head that he would think that it would be appropriate to compare men you know who serve their country who are waiting for potentially you know life and death uh, care to somebody standing in line for you know Mr. Toad's wild ride and the only thing I can get is, is it is that sort of bureaucratic uh, mentality where you spend too much time sitting around with consultants and whiteboards talking about best practices and trying to come up with various analogies because the moment he said it he had to have known that comparing something serious to you know something that is completely optional was was inappropriate uh, is, he, is he gonna keep his job it's likely that he will with President Obama there. But even his apology was only half an apology. Right. It was disgusting. He just never should have said it. No, he, he never should have said it. Now, you may not want to hear it, but we will tell you anyway. Let's hand out some unsolicited advice. Michael Holt, you are first. Well, Milwaukee Aldermen have agreed with comments made by Dan and myself in which we criticize Chief Ed Flynn for his insensitive remarks about gun violence. In fact, they've called a meeting for the chief to explain himself. My advice to Flynn, don't try to be funny this time. Michelle Litchens. So everybody, take out your smartphone and Google where the closest Memorial Day service is to you. Take your family and spend an hour honoring those who gave everything so that you have an extra day off of work. Dan Adams. Well, my advice, go visit Frank Yakubchak in his European sausage shop, a world-renowned sausage maker on Milwaukee's south side. Frank is finally retiring. The shop's closing at the end of the summer, so get there fast. Colin Roth. And my advice is for Donald Trump. You're the Republican nominee. You can stop attacking fellow Republicans <coughs> like New Mexico Governor Susanna Martinez anytime now. Yeah, good luck with that. Uh, well, my unsolicited advice is to uh, President Obama. Mr. President, if you are going to visit Hiroshima, how about also scheduling a visit to Pearl Harbor later this year on the 75th anniversary of the attack there. Next on Sunday Insight, well, that was easy. Why did final approval for a new Bucks arena for the Bucks go so quickly? The Bucks get the final approval for their new arena, and the vote wasn't even close. In fact, Milwaukee Alderman voted unanimously to approve the massive arena development plan, and that is, well, that's a dramatic contrast to other fights over sports stadiums, including the legendary, bloody, brutal battle over Miller Park back in the 1990s. So, Michael Holt, why was this one so easy? Because we're talking about a $3 billion development that could revitalize downtown, and nobody wanted to seem as if they were opposed to the jobs and all of these monies coming in. You got Northwestern and all the rest of this stuff. You know, uh, but nobody in politics agrees with it, it, you know on anything anymore. And generally, these things have been and really plus lightning safe. rods. What? You know, and plus they're real, real safe because right. everybody was just reelected, so they get four years for people to forget in case there's any controversy along the way. I mean, isn't it? I mean, not pretty obvious given the vote, though, that they, the Bucks have done a marvelous job lobbying or, or at least oh, ne yeah. neutralizing opposition. They have, and and the wage, uh, inc well, the wage agreement was just announced two weeks ago, and all the politicians were there. Cutting ribbons and, and taking uh, their hoorahs for that, uh, they're going to pay a really good wage for every single worker on the job. Yeah, yeah, you know, if you would have asked me a couple of years ago, you know, how big a sell, how, big, how heavy a lift is, is this going to be, I would have said, look, given what we went through with, with, uh, with Miller Park, given how hard it was to get a tax uh, imposed for Lambeau Field up in Green Bay of all places. You know? there, there isn't a tax in right, this one, right? One, right, The state's not going to be at a loss in the future right. at all. This is a huge development, like Michael said, for the downtown area. So, and obviously, um, they did a lot of lobbying ahead of time, so I think they had a lot of the kinks worked out before they actually. A lot came of up people lobby, but they don't necessarily succeed, and, and, and they clearly succeeded. What made this different from Miller Park? 
Yeah, well, the, the tricky aspect, I think, was really getting, you know, the Republican legislators right. and the governor and the state to, to agree with local officials and to kind of get that buy-in from any out-state Republicans. They kind of solved that problem last year. And I think once that train got going, there, yeah. was, there was no stopping it. Yeah, I, I think actually Michael Holt put his finger on it, though, that, that the, the genius, to the extent there's, it is a genius, was that it, rather than portraying this just as a sports arena, this becomes a massive development. And when you're talking about a development this size, do you really want to stand up against it? I mean, it's one thing to have a, you know, um, you know taxpayer subsidy for, for a, you know, an NBA team, but they rather masterfully, you know, made the footprint of this project much, much, much longer. Okay, Colin Roth, uh, another big development this uh, week, Wisconsin joining other states in suing against the Obama administration's transgender rule. Good move? Uh, I think it is a good move, and I think it is based in federalism and localism, and I think that's really where the heart of this debate comes in. Not everything has to be a national issue. Not everything has to come down from guidance from the White House. Okay, that may, that may be yeah. the, the, the yeah. you know, high end, you know, bird's eye view, yeah. intellectual view, but from the ground, it looks like it's, it's bullying, frankly. If you aren't allowing kids... If you're not allowing kids to be in the place where they feel most comfortable, I mean, this should not be. An, I agree, it should not be in a national issue, but it shouldn't be a state issue okay, either. Okay, but that's the why isn't are we the as point? adults yeah. uh, debating where uh, Johnny and, and Jenny are? Well, paying, because because you know, I, I don't know because <laughs> maybe, maybe you don't want Johnny coming into the, the girls' locker room. Title Nine was yes. originally designed to protect women, and now what the Obama administration has done is to rewrite Title Nine to make it something that was never intended to be. You know, reading into a transgender rights and I think it's important for you know the state to push back in the courts and say first of all however you care about this transgender issue you know how about forcing the administration to abide by the law as right. it's written right yeah. if they want to include gender identity yeah. in title nine they need to go through Congress to that's get it done law. the yeah. president cannot do this by executive fiat which is exactly how he's been doing everything so that's wrong and again we might disagree on that I do believe local government should be addressing this issue locally yeah. I think they might have a different take on it sometimes when it's a local issue like that Michael well, as I was doing all this extensive research on this yeah. you know the first public toilets were in Massachusetts I think in 1887 uh, and then at the same and then like 20 years later, there was a pressy decision which meant they could put up signs saying colored and white. This is a little so, bit different. Well, I mean, it, it is a little Everybody bit different. Everybody has the same plumbing in that particular case. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but they, they said that there was something wrong with black folks' plumbing yeah. and with black folks Look, because this, we had VD. No, keep, that was a newspaper back then. This, again, is one of those issues, and I agree with Dan here, that ought to be solved at the state and the local level. There's common sense solutions, including, you know, the, the unisex, unisex bathrooms. The unisex bathrooms, which basically solve it. This, was a, this is a solution in search of a problem. I don't know that this was a crisis. I also think there's a big distinction between bathrooms and locker rooms yes. and I think that to the the extent that the federal government is is trying to you know order and intimidate local you know uh, state and lo it, local schools it's a push back against they, state government no, doing but, the but, same stuff but they are the bullies it is the the federal government telling every single school district what their bathroom policy should be if the federal government can dictate that then is there anything that we leave up to local communities and families and school boards? Is there any any? It kind of like sounds made? like the state of Wisconsin, where the Republicans dictating everything for Milwaukee. Whoa. Well, what is it that you don't get this week? Let's go around the table. Michael Holt, you are first. What I don't get is, why is Gary George running against Representative Gwen Moore? Yeah. He may have legitimate concerns, but he can't win, and he can't be seated if he is elected. Michelle Litchens. Charlie, I don't get why millennials are the first generation in 130 years who are more likely to live at home with their parents than live with someone else or on their own. Why? Dan Adams. I don't get how anyone's surprised that the Milwaukee County Board badly screwed up their free bus fare scheme for seniors. The scheme, unasked for by senior or transportation advocates, has ripped a hole in our transportation budget. It's shameful. Yeah, that's one of the undercovered stories. Um, Colin Roth. What I still don't get is how America settled for a choice between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton at this critical juncture. <laughs> Well, what I don't get is why VA Secretary Bob McDonald still has his job waiting in line for what Pirates of the Caribbean is not the same thing as waiting in line for life and death medical treatment. And anyone who does not know that just does not deserve to be working with our veterans. Next on Sunday Inside, our panel picks the winners and losers of the week. But first, here's your morning news update. It's time for our panel to pick the winners and losers of the week. Michael Holt, you're first. I don't know what's worse, that George Zimmerman got 
thousand dollars for the gun he used to murder an unarmed black teenager. Why there so many fools bid on it? My winner, students at MLK, Lancaster, Sherman, and Roosevelt Elementary Schools, who are the recipients of the President's Turnaround Arts Grants. Mm. Michelle Lichens. Well, on Friday, my winner, Tom Wester of Brookfield, was commissioned as an officer in the United States Naval Academy. He graduated number one in his class. The last time a Wisconsin native graduated number one from the Naval Academy, it was 1977. That's a tremendous accomplishment, Tom. My loser is President Obama, who visited Hiroshima, where he preached to the world that he, he should never go to war and we must solve our differences through diplomacy. Obama didn't apologize outright for our use of the nuclear bomb but he came as close as he could to doing so. Dan Adams. Well, my winner is Milwaukee DA John Chisholm, who despite leading a rather more bund office, unable to address rising crime, is cruising to re-election due to totally a lack of a serious opponent in August primary. Uh, my loser is Waukesha County Clerk Kathleen Novak, who testified this week that urban areas have, quote, too much access to the polls. Ms. Novak apparently believes clerks should make voting hard to do. It's unbelievable and outrageous. Colin Roth. My winners this week are the heroes who have made the ultimate sacrifice from the revolution to our wars against the Islamic State. My loser is Hillary Clinton. A new State Department Inspector General report revealed Clinton has continuously lied and deceived, and ultimately she thought the laws and rules don't apply to her. This is not going away. Well, my loser, all of us voters who will have to be forced to choose between two of the most unpopular politicians in American history. My winners, like uh, Colin, the men and women who gave all for their country and for our freedoms this weekend, take some time to honor their memory. Now, you didn't miss Meet the Press. It's coming on at 10 o'clock this morning. Thanks for joining us. Join me for my, morning, my um, radio show on, on Tuesday morning at, 6, at 8.30 on WTMJ. Thanks. <laughs>